When we made Night of the Living Dead, it was like, oh, it's a fluke, and these guys from Pittsburgh. There was no climate for that, and it, and it wasn't like today with digital production. You know, you, you couldn't make a movie back then unless you spent uh, at least seventy or eighty thousand bucks. And a movie like Night of the Living Dead was going to cost over a hundred thousand. Now you can make a movie for dirt cheap, and uh, so there was no. Climate. Nobody. We, George and I both had to make our next several movies for crappy, but you know, hundred thousand bucks. I made Midnight for seventy thousand dollars total. The crew was me and three other guys, with exception of a couple days where we had some helpers that weren't even filmmakers. And seventy thousand dollars, seventy-one thousand actually, the whole movie, and everything was paid, including a Nix in New York at Magno Sound where. Uh, I think Scorsese still mixes. Woody Allen used to mix there. I mean, this is a first-class expensive mix on seventy-one thousand dollars, thirty-five millimeter color. And most of the time, the distributor's trying to save money, and they're sending me three and four rolls at a time of film, and I'm running out of film. And it was light struck film, you know, light struck. It was spool down. Okay, what they do is they take two thousand feet of film that's used in laboratories to go into a dark room and spool it off onto 400 foot rolls. Well, if it's hit with light, by accident, you end up with light flashes. And I lost some of the best shots, but I always shoot a safety. So a lot of times I was just lucky to be able to put a scene together because there were light flashes on the good takes and I'd have to go with third and fourth choice takes to put the damn thing together. And through all that, you know, it's still a pretty decent movie for uh, not much, not much money. Oh. I wrote the screenplay, and I, uh, a friend of mine, Don Redinger, that I used to work with, said that he had $35,000. That he could he could put into the movie, and I called Sam Sherman up because Sam had distributed the Booby Hatch, a low budget sex satire that I made, and uh, I told Sam what I wanted to do, and I was figuring on shooting 16 millimeter. He said, "No, don't shoot 16. Shoot 35. I'll send. I'll give you another 35,000 and send you a camera." So, so he did, and. Uh, <laughs> the camera that he sent was a 35 millimeter blimped Aeroflex and it arrived the day we're shooting. And I said, I can't. It was one thing to do Night of the Living Dead with this klutzy camera, but here I have, I don't even have a crew. You know, I got me and three other guys. And, and uh, if I have to shoot this move, handle this blimp, I'll never get it done. In, in the time necessary to, to do it on such a low budget. So I had to wait to get, send that camera back and wait to get, um, uh, to get a, 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 a BL, 35 Aeroflex BL to shoot with. In the uh, meantime, holding up the shooting. There were lots of things that even the, on the low budget screwed up because most of the actors were kids from Pittsburgh Playhouse and they assured me they could get out of their classes to do the movie. Turned out not true. I'd be waiting hours and hours and hours for them to show up, losing shooting time left and right, running out of film stock, driving all over Pittsburgh trying to borrow film. That kind of, you know, what a way to make a movie. So I had not even the advantages of at least Night of the Living Dead. We had a lot of people cooperating. We had more money. We had, you know, we had support. I had no support really. 
on that movie, but the way I am is I'll get it done if it kills me, and it's lucky that it hasn't so far. I lost so much damn footage that there's screen direction, you know, I tried to cut it in such a way, instead of the van having a movement right to left or left to right consistently, there are shots that mix up, so I separated it, had him get out of the van, and, but I had to use every shot I had because of the ones that were lost. I almost hit that guy. He was carrying something. Did you see that? It's lucky I saw anything at all. Thanks for telling me, Nance. There's something creepy about that guy. I got a look at his face. He was grinning even when it looked like you were going to hit him, Tom. At the time that I was writing uh, Midnight, uh, the title was The Congregation. And because she did have a congregation, an evil congregation. And I, I like playing off of religion, and especially worked religion, which is <laughs> almost the only kind. <laughs> Lucifer, we ask you to bless her, the source of our community. May her blood give us strength and vitality. In the book, the girl has a double life. She, she's, uh, she has the crazy things going on with her brothers in the backwoods, but she also has a, an occult store in New York, and she has an entire congregation in New York that are these really bizarre... Um, uh, uh, um, there are people that aid and abet her delusions because they're in it for the sex and the, and the sadism, which is a whole interesting element that I would have loved to do, but on that kind of budget I couldn't, you know, because I wrote the novel before, I could have incorporated those scenes, and if I ever remake the picture, which again I would love to do, because it's a story that works for people, then I would like to do the, the New York stuff. I'm pretty sure I didn't see Texas Chainsaw Massacre until after I met Toby Hooper, so, and that was in the 80s. But I had seen some of these other films, so I did have kind of have in mind the, you know, the, I can't think of the names of the movies, but think that whole kind of thing where, where you get people off in the woods and they're, they're uh, well, like, like, like Deliverance, where uh, James Dickey made the point that people, most people have an atavistic fear of being being set upon by strangers, so I did have that in my mind, and also the um, just perverted religion and perverted beliefs, which lead to you know will drive people crazy and cause them to do some horrible things. It's midnight. Time to begin. Well, Sam came up with the title Midnight. He always comes up with things like, he said, everything's a time, everything's a time zone, timeline, Friday the 13th, you know, but the time of greatest fear is midnight. That was his catch line. I didn't particularly like the title, but there it is. You're on your own. You're all alone. And at your door. As far as the song Midnight, there's a, uh, a group called the Sound Castle here in Pittsburgh, and they're really, really talented. And I forget how I hooked up. I think Paul McCullough, who shot the movie and did the editing with me, uh, knew of the Sound Castle. And we, and we brought them in and showed them the movie, and they came up with a song. So I ended up with a song in the movie, which I never thought I would. And it, I didn't th think of that. Well, Tom was working, he was the Black Knight in the Knight Riders, which was shooting at the same time, so he was more interested in that. And so he kind of, uh, he, he got the skeleton, which was a real skeleton, and, uh, and he, he made some of the props, and then he kind of just went off to do Knight Riders, so the, uh, uh, I ended up doing the, like the blood, when the kids get shot, you know, just balloons with blood and the effects when Lawrence Tierney shows up at the end, the stabbings and the blood coming out of the brain of the big guy, I did all that because Tom wasn't around. I told him, um, you see the kids 
in, 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 in midnight it opens with these kids that, and their crazy mother and they, they kill this young girl who's caught in a trap. And then it takes up with the story of Nancy, the heroine of the movie, and, go, and goes all the way to the point where the big guy comes out of the woods with the body in his hands. And now when she's chased into the farmhouse, you don't really know at first who these people are and you don't. I didn't want to use a subtitle that says 20 years later. I wanted it. The, I want it to be a shock and a revelation that these are those same people. Well, the only way that works is when, if, if when you see the mother who's in, dead, she looks like the mother that you saw up front. Has to be in the same dress and, you know, has to look the same. So I'm talking about to Tom about this and I said, you have to be able to, even though she's dead, partially mummified, you have to be able to recognize her. He said, oh, oh, he has this boundless enthusiasm, you know, and he'll go off, I'll do this, I'll make a mask, and I'll do this to it, and, you know, dead flesh blackens, and, and you know, sometimes, and I'll do that. I said, Tom, whatever you do, it, she has to be immediately recognizable. You don't have to go overboard with black flesh. If, the, if you're not going to recognize her, don't do it. And, Oh, don't worry, don't worry. They'll know exactly because I'll make the life mask from her face, I'll, her actual face. So he comes in, and again, I think it was the same day that the camera had to be sent in, and I'm losing hours and hours, and Amplis was in a play, and he's late, and Tom has taken six or seven hours making up Jackie Nickel. <sighs> we finally start shooting maybe three or four in the morning. Amplis, if you look close, Amplis has fallen asleep. He's down there in the hood, hood and robe, and he's, there are shots where he's, he's like this. He was half drunk, too. So then he brings Jackie Nickel in with that makeup on, and it's a black mask, and you can't recognize her. And I had to shoot. I couldn't lose it. I, you know, I didn't have money to to go through it all again and redo it. <laughs> so <laughs> when I showed the movie to George, he was on the phone doing things and watching the movie at the same time, to be fair. But that scene came up and George, George said, who are those people? <laughs> I think if you're paying attention, you, you do, I, mean, I haven't, had people ask me that question. George was the only one, so I, I guess they do get it. And, uh, uh, but man. Almighty Lord Satan, we worship you with all our hearts and humbly submit to your desires and commandments. My first edit ended just like the book with the girl in the cage and you know she's gonna die. And Sam said that we're gonna have trouble getting our rating and if we have this uncompromising ending, we'll never get it and so you know, you should probably shoot a new ending. So I wrote all that stuff when the, the stepfather does come back. You'd like that, wouldn't you, big brother? <laughs> I had to change the ending. He didn't come back, he ran away. And I had another scene with the wife where he lies to the wife about it. I had to take that scene out and I had to uh, figure that the audience would probably buy that he had a change of heart and did not after all come after his if that if i wouldn't have taken that second scene out you really wouldn't have bought it in that ending actually amplis comes after her and she she gets him with the with the sickle in the stomach and he dies and then we decided sam or somebody said that's too much sometimes less is more <laughs> i had a lot of problems with midnight because it's really funny too because the machete that the, that the cop's head gets cut off with was the same machete that Tom used in Friday the 13th. Okay, very same one. And Friday the 13th got an R because it was paramount with all the blood and gore there. And that's a major, you know. So now I come along and they're going to give me an X. And they made me take things out to make me look like an idiot. Like, I had, when the girl's tossing the frisbee and the bad guys grab her, 
Well, I had to cut out the next scene. And they said that I had the husband come, come after her and then he gets grabbed and he's stabbed, but he's behind a wood pile. You just see the dagger going up and down. You don't even see any him being stabbed. But it, it, when it, but it was a very effective scene. He gets grabbed by the throat, thrown down, and it was shocking, you know, it worked. Well, it worked too well, they said, take it out. What? So now I'm the idiot that had a girl captured and the husband went about his business as if not, he didn't care enough about his wife to come after her. Sharon! Friday the 13th came out and then the, a rash of imitators and so by the time midnight was ready there was a glut of, of slasher films. So Sam's idea, Sam Sherman said look, he was going to hold it out of release for a while till the glut subsided. But it didn't subside, it got worse. So it ended up, it was held out of release for two years instead of going into release and then that penalizes the movie makers because we did all this work and put the money in and now there's no income because the picture isn't even being distributed. Well, I'm kind of proud that Midnight got, got banned in South Africa when they had apartheid because, you know, people that do things like apartheid or execute people for having the wrong idea about God, they always have censorship of other people's thoughts and ideas and what they're going to do. So they had the strictest censorship board at the time when they had apartheid. And I got this long document about why this picture that was so morally corrupt couldn't possibly play in the Union of South Africa. <laughs> and I kept it, I have it somewhere. Midnight came out and it, it played quite a few places and it made some money. The movie did get a lot of good reviews and kind of a cult following. And um, and so it's been re-released on DVD a bunch of times and it was sold in a lot other countries. So fairly successful, but not a lot of money in it for us. Hold it there, fellas. Don't you make any foolish moves. Keep your hands visible. You reach for anything inside that bag and I won't wait to see what you're reaching for. When I met Quentin Tarantino at the uh, Land of the Dead premiere, um, he said, you're the guy that wrote the books, and I didn't know what he meant because I've done novels and then the movie-making books. And I said, which books? And he said, the movie-making books. And then later we were having a drink together at the bar, and he said, he said, you know, I made a movie I didn't complete, and then I read your books and I took notes and made charts, and that's what guided me through my first complete movie, which, uh, that's a really great quote <laughs> for me. And I have a movie-making program that you know, I, I usually tell people when they're considering where to enroll, things like that. Because I get that kind of comment a lot. Kevin Smith and Scott Mosier, same thing. But everything from noted filmmakers to people just doing their first film, that's being a teacher, an ex-teacher while well, I'm teaching again in my own program. You know, that's maybe the most gratifying thing to be, in, in a, to a large extent about having made Night of the Living Dead and everything I've been able to do since. Oh, 